Welcome to Premise Podcast. This is your host, Angelo Sophocleus. In the second part of our conversation with Professor Constantin Santis, a professor of philosophy at the University of Hertfordshire, we have a discussion on the philosophy of the Austrian philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. In particular, we analyze Wittgenstein's picture theory of meaning, examine his use on meaning in language, and make a distinction between the early and later Wittgenstein. Further, we explain what Wittgenstein meant with sentences such as whereof one can speak, one must remain silent. So, let me start with making the distinction in, uh, in argumentative logic between necessity and sufficiency. Sure. So, to say that X is a necessary condition for Y is to say that it is impossible to have Y without X. And to say that X is a sufficient condition for Y is to say that the presence of X guarantees the presence of Y. And Wittgenstein wrote in a, in a period in which philosophers such as Russell and Frege uh, were trying to, to make philosophy a discipline like mathematics or, or logic in which philosophy would be expressed in necessary and sufficient terms. Uh, However, Wittgenstein, especially on the concept of language, thought that we cannot give the exact definition of a word. We cannot give the necessary and sufficient conditions under which a particular word is defined. Uh, He used the example of a game. We all know what we're referring to when we when we're referring to a game, but it's very difficult to see what uh, Monopoly, Solitaire and football have in common. Yes. So I um, this is certainly an aspect of Wittgenstein's work that I'm deeply um, sympathetic with. I mean, I, I think just to kind of nitpick, I mean, I, I think, of course, we can give definitions um, of things. Uh, I don't think Wittgenstein is, is against um, that and I can open the OED and look up definitions of of games and so on. Um, but the point is that unless we're talking about technical concepts, our ordinary use of words and the definitions we give for them will not take the form of necessary and sufficient conditions. So what will happen is um, we'll we'll have paradigm cases of what counts as a game and maybe. In the number of definitions that that a um, a large dictionary will give you, we'll get um, some more paradigmatic ones on top, and then we'll get kind of variants of, um, of this. And people um, got very excited by um, many years ago now, um, but they still bring up this this book, uh, The Grasshopper, where the author um, ref- is meant to refute Wittgenstein. He does this, um, he tries to do this twice. There's a kind of longer definition and a shorter definition of a game. I think the shorter one says something like, games are the voluntary overcoming of obstacles. And people like to quote this as some kind of uh, refutation of of Wittgenstein. And I I think that to the contrary, it shows exactly what's right about Wittgenstein and the temptation to think that Um, we can define something like game in in these terms. Um, For one, I mean, voluntary of all the words someone could have picked on, which have raised all sorts of trouble in um, philosophy, um, of both from metaphysics to ordinary language kind of philosophy, was, I think, a bad bad start. I don't know about you, but uh, I often play games involuntarily. I'm not particularly... Um, you know, you might be asked to play games in your school at PE lesson and you don't particularly want to. Um, you may be playing, I don't know, games at some family gathering and may do so involuntarily. So I think from from the very first word, um, we've got a problem there. Um, so, so let alone to when it comes to overcoming obstacles and so on. But, but I think a kind of anti-essentialism that's motivated by the thought that our language is alive, um, it evolves, it's open-ended. I think it's it's hugely important, even to the stuff I was talking about before, 
um, not just in relation to reasons and action, but in relation to words like think and reason and belief and desire. So the thought that there are going to be necessary and sufficient conditions um, for what it is to think and that will rule out whether computers can think or not um, is, I think, uh, um, mistaken. Mm -hmm. And you thought that language has limits in that it, uh, language restricts us in talking about the world and accurately describing the world. And that's why he thought that questions about uh, what's the meaning of life are meaningless. How how did he use the term meaningless? Because I think he used it in a very in a very particular form. Yes. Yeah, so I think so. While what we were talking about before is, I think, true of pretty much Wittgenstein at pretty much any any time of his of his um, philosophical life. What you're talking about now is typically associated with the early Wittgenstein and my own view is that he does without getting into boring exegetical detail that he does change his mind on this so the view that there are these kind of um, limits and there are important things that that we can't say without lapsing into nonsense um, I, I tie to the early Wittgenstein I don't think this is carried over to his his later work so I think he changes his mind about this yes. um, but to to um, and I think he was right to change his mind, actually, though there's something very attractive in those remarks, especially towards the end of the Tractatus and also in his lecture um, on ethics. And I think nonsense here, um, I mean, Wittgenstein uses nonsense in different ways, I think, across his work. But but nonsense here really means something like senseless. So um, these remarks have no sense. So we can't attribute um, truth and falsehood to them, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but but it's important to note that tautologies um, will be um, senseless in this um, in, in this use of, of the term. It's good that you touched on the distinction that's made in literature uh, between the early Wittgenstein and the later Wittgenstein. So let's start with the early Wittgenstein, the early Wittgenstein, in, which is um, expressed by his uh, book, The Tractatus, he thinks that the limits of my language are the limits of my world. And he also uh, refers to the to a picture theory of meaning. Do you mind the, uh, expanding on, on the yes. picture theory? Yes, so I think um, the first of these two things um, remains pretty much, uh, in some sense, remains pretty much constant throughout, throughout his work. And um, so the thought of uh, language limiting one's world um, um, is there in the investigations as well, I think. Um, but the picture theory, um, I mean, I, I should preface this with, uh, as I'm sure you know, these are hotly sort of contested issues, uh, different um, views on what's going on in the tractatus and how it relates to the, in, the investigations and, and different readings of the tractators. So what I say won't be true on what's sometimes called a resolute reading. Um, but but on um, as I read the early Wittgenstein, he really does have a picture theory in which words stand for things, re represent things um, in the world. Um, let's call them um, states of affairs. And so um, language is like a kind of pictorial map, um, if you like, with um, correlations between. Um, so I try and capture the world with these kind of linguistic pictures. And so conceived, words have a, a very particular role um, and indeed um, a kind of essence to capture the thing that they are pictures of. And we can talk of accurate and inaccurate pictures and I, I think all of this gets abandoned um, in the later work. So in his later work, The Philosophical Investigations, he says, even if God could look into our minds, he would not be able to tell whether we mean what we inwardly say. And his point was that the meaning of a particular word is determined by how it's used by the communities which use that word. So he sort of, he sort of viewed language as a tool and words as 
having their meaning from how they're used. Yes, it's tied to this uh, thought associated um, with Wittgenstein that in a sense no nothing is hidden. And so if if you want to know what someone's meet what someone means by a certain word or um, what people mean by a certain word within a community, what you do is you look at how they use the word, you look at the practices um, associated with their use of this word, and that's how you figure out what the word means, not by looking inside their heads, and you won't find anything. Um, you'll find all sorts of interesting things inside their heads, but you won't find the meaning, yeah. and you certainly won't find um, the use. And um, Wittgenstein thought this in relation to a bunch of things. If you want to know what someone intends, what someone believes, what someone desires, you don't look inside their head and look for the mental or brain state um, that's going to tell you. Um, you. You look at their behavior and how it's embedded within what wider context of their lives. And I, 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 I think if this is true, I actually think this works with AI as well to go back to um, to our previous theme. So I mm -hmm. think it's a mistake to think that the explanation to AI behavior is something that's hidden inside a black box. And if only we could look inside the black box, we would find out what it was thinking or something like that or why it behaved um, as it did. But anyway, that's regressing back to, to the previous um, theme. So that's why he made the what's called the private language argument that public has to be prior to the private. We participate in a community using particular words and only then we know the word's meaning. It's not that the private leads to the public, but it's a public which determines the word's meaning. Is that what you try to um, say with the private language? Yes, uh, and in in the sense of private in which he's he's interested in, there would be no no such thing as as a private language. There's there, there are interesting questions there. Um, Stephen Mulhall, for example, has raised the sort of a sort of question of well, are we meant to understand the thing that that's impossible? Are we meant to sort of know what a private language looks like? And Dan Wittgenstein tells us there's no such thing, or or is the point rather that we don't even know what what a private language um, would be? We can't even give meaning to to the sort of um, um, expression private language unless it means something which Wittgenstein doesn't deny, um, namely that you know you and I can devise our own private code. But the point is that a code like that is in principle um, breakable. And um, and it's breakable not because someone is looking inside our head, but just by looking at how the code is being used. Um, mm -hmm. And that's not what counts as a private um, language in the sense that's meant to be problematic, if indeed there's a sense there at all. Um, and so so yes, I think words get their meanings in other ways. But I'm I'm suspicious of this um, of the thought that there's such a thing as the meaning of any particular word or expression. Of course, some meanings are more central than others. Some are more paradigmatic than others. Others are just maybe um, less common or more peripheral in, in other ways. But, you know, giving rise to new uses of words is something that, that happens every every minute of the day, really. So we can't it's not as if we look, we observe all these things and then we suddenly or conduct some kind of statistical survey and then we suddenly have the meaning of um, intentional or something like that or even something like book. So this stuff is open-ended, I think. And if that's right, then all kinds of essentialism are in trouble. Exactly. It's. I agree with reading aside that we cannot find the meaning of a word in its etymology and we have to think of the of how it's used as you mentioned how private language is breakable we can think of inside jokes for example mm -hmm. um two people might uh, might have an inside joke and in a way they will use certain words in a different meaning than uh, the meaning that the public has in mind but it's something that's breakable it's, it's something that can become public if uh, we are going to explain this inside joke that you and I might have to 
to a third person and we explain the circumstances under which the inside joke was developed. So, yeah, it's, it's interesting to see this uh, interplay between private and public. Th- that's right. So I, I completely agree with, with what you said. And it, it also leads to, I, I think, the thing that I find most, probably most fascinating right now in, in Wittgenstein's work, which is that um, just because these things are in principle public, it doesn't mean that that they're easy um, to understand. So, of course, an inside joke may be something that's very, very hard to explain to other people. And that um, may have to do with um, the shared biographies of the people sharing the joke. It may have to do with um, if the joke is in a particular language and doesn't work quite well in other languages. It might be that you need to know all sorts of things about other people. And but somehow t- telling someone else about all this stuff that you and I have in common, if we make the inside joke, won't necessarily make the joke funny because, of course, you've got to have known these people or places um, in the way in which we we did and so on. So while there's nothing that's principle private there, um, it doesn't mean that understanding is easy. Um, like Wittgenstein said, some people are transparent and others are a complete enigma to us. And people can be, I mean, the language he uses there is very interesting. He People can be um, in certain ways impossible or near impossible to understand. Um, he talks about being unable to find our feet um, with other people um, and not because we don't know what they're saying to one another. So it's not, you know, in Wittgenstein, the question of understanding isn't some easy thing that's oh, right, there's no private language, therefore everything is is kind of transparent. It, it's not like that at all. And so I, f- I find what I find most interesting in Wittgenstein is this um, perfectly acceptable but apparent tension between the sort of anti-skepticism where there's no kind of problem of knowledge in, in the old empiricist sense of how to, how do I know anything? How do I know other people exist and other minds and so on? Yet at the same time, an appreciation of the immense difficulty that some cases of one person understanding another can involve and how you can go through a whole lifetime and still feel that you've in some sense failed. Mm-hmm. So moving on to to an example he gave that the beetle in a box. Would you mind expanding on that? What was he trying to show with the beetle in a box example? So the beetle in the box, there's, there's kind of two different ways I could I, I could introduce this for you. Um, mm-hmm. in, in the first way, it's not unrelated to the remark you um, mentioned earlier about um, looking into someone's mind and the ways in which we discussed how what you find in there doesn't really matter. Um, for the kind of things um, one is looking for if you want to know what someone meant by a word or why they behaved um, as they did. And in a way, um, the beetle in the in, in the box is a way of making that same same point. Um, but but it it also brings out some other things. So the box, of course, is a is a matchbox. And, you know, school children would maybe keep beetles in matchboxes. Um, what's interesting about the matchbox is that, in a way, it isn't inside, you know, someone's skull. So it it doesn't have that aspect of the inner. But there's there, there's nonetheless, and I think Wittgenstein is exploring different senses of inner and outer. So with the first in the beetle um, in the box example, the first thing that that does is it tells us to not be under the grip of a particular picture of what counts as inner because the, um, there's still a box and the beetle is inside the box, even if the box is on your hand and we, we can exchange boxes and so on. So first we realize that there's something that's still relevantly inner in the box example, and it's got nothing to do with being behind a skull or something like that. Um, and again, I think it will be relevant to um, what people mean when they talk about black boxes and in, in non-human examples. Um, then the next step is to sort of think about whether what's going on inside a box affects how we talk about things. And I think the clearest, sort of quickest way of 
thinking about this is thinking of people who worry about um, inverted spectrum in philosophy um, in relation to color. So the thoughts is um, the classical thought that we've all had at, at some point early on in our philosophical youth, that what if what you see as blue is what I see as green um, or whatever. And the temptation is to think that I can never know what you see as green because I'd have to somehow enter your mind or something like that. Um, I could never um, have your um, phenomenology. All, all we know is that there seems to be um, agreement in language, and yet maybe your world is completely different to, to my world. And so I think what Wittgenstein, um, referring back to the thought of language being the limits of one's world, Wittgenstein thinks that actually, if I ask you, well, what do you see as green? You can point to things in the world and you can tell me these are green, these are blue. And if I disagree with you, then we know that maybe um, one of us is visually impaired in, in, in some way. But if we come to agreement, then there's an important sense in which we both see the same things as green and the same things as red and so on. And we know there are counterexamples. We know there are cases like the dress a few years ago that different people saw in different ways. Mm -hmm. And that's not hidden. We find this out very, very quickly. Then there's the kind of persisting thought that, oh, but maybe the phenology is different. Um, it's inside you in some way. And that's the beetle in the box. There's the thought that um, Wittgenstein says at some point, maybe there doesn't even need to be a beetle in, in the box. I don't know if that's a precursor to people who talk about zombies or something like that. But the thought is that whatever's in the box doesn't affect our language for how we talk about these things. If you say I have a beetle in my box or I'm seeing green or I'm seeing red and I agree with you, then we, we can reach this agreement without ever looking inside um, the boxes. So the beetle can be anything. I the, mean, the um, beetle can be, we can refer to anything as the beetle. If we are, if we agree about what so the thing I, is, so I think the the important thing is that um, we're not really referring to the thing inside. Um, the important thing is that if you're thinking of the beetle as an, as analogous to um, to color, that that when we talk about something's being green, we're not pointing to an inner sensation. We're pointing to something in the world. So it's not that the idea isn't that we're pointing to to the beetle. And then describing it to a, to another person. So yes, the beetle can can be anything, but the beetle plays no role in our linguistic practices. Now, if someone says, "Oh, but surely what what's going on is that you have a certain sensation of green whenever you see green," Wittgenstein responds by asking you, "Well, how did you learn how to use the word green, and how do you learn how to use the word?" beetle and so on and it's not by looking in, inside mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's not through introspection or by looking inside your matchbox that you find out what the word beetle means so on that there seems to be a tendency to we we sort of have this this need to look inside the box in order to determine what the beetle is and perhaps that's that's what uh, Wittgenstein said that the aim of his philosophy is to show the fly the way out of the fly bottle. He thought that philosophers struggled with some questions that couldn't be answered, such as what we discussed before about the meaning of life, and they ignore perhaps the cultural aspect of language, uh, how language is depicted in society. Yes, I think um, you're quite right. Um, so the need, the need is not um, a philosophical uh, need in the sense that this is what philosophy must do, um, but rather it's it's a sort of um, almost psychological need we have that we can't help but want to think this stuff matters. We there's something that draws us to thinking of things in these ways that that Wittgenstein thought were wrong. And what's really important in this, which I think is played down by a lot of um, Wittgenstein's followers is that it's not as if, so suppose for a moment that we're we're both agreeing with Wittgenstein, it's not as if once you read Wittgenstein and agree with him, 
um, these temptations magically um, disappear and you're done with it. Of course, if you train yourself in various ways, certain temptations might decrease, um, but they, as language evolves, they'll reappear time and time again in, in new form. And Wittgenstein himself is struggling all the time. We get these kind of um, dialogues in the investigations um, with himself where he's He's um, sometimes there's an interlocutor that clearly isn't Wittgenstein, but other times it really is just things he's still tempted to think. And it's very hard to completely free ourselves from these temptations to think that certain things are kind of philosophically important and they draw us away from observing things that are hidden in plain sight um, right in front of our eyes. And I think in this respect, we could say that what Wittgenstein really does is the psychology of philosophy. And mm -hmm. he's not the first to do this. We have um, Nietzsche before him and I think Hume before that. So we have three great philosophers, in my opinion, who do um, the psychology of, of philosophizing. And what they do is they kind of pull the rug under the feet of the philosopher by asking questions about why are they thinking in a certain way um, to begin with, rather than accept certain assumptions and then start the sort of conceptual um, manipulation that we all do. So as we're coming to an end, I would like to ask you how you think Wittgenstein can be applied in the modern world and in our everyday lives, for example, when it comes to understanding. How can we use Wittgenstein's philosophy in the modern world? I'm very glad you asked this question. It's something that's particularly important, not just to me, but to the British Wittgenstein Society and particularly my colleague, Danielle Moyle Sharrock, who um, founded the society and is the president, that, that what we really want to do is, um, while, um, of course, these exegetical questions are, are hugely important and I think interesting, what we want to do is take Wittgenstein out there and see modern sort of debates through this kind of lens. Um, there's no end to the examples I can give here. We've talked about AI a little bit, so, so I won't um, bring that, that up again. Um, another place where Wittgenstein has clearly made differences, um, law and particularly criminal law, with um, people like um, HLA Hart. But um, to give just the, a few more examples, if, if there's, um, do we have time for, for a few more examples? Yeah, of course. Um, so think of debates about in primatology, for example, questions of animal minds and animal language. Um, there's, there's some really good work being done where you don't assume a particular kind of theory of mind um, and then go and apply it to the question of um, do animals have minds, but you rather kind of um, um, observe and see. And inactivism is a big thing that's been, I don't work in this myself, but a big thing that's been um, influenced by by Wittgenstein that, that applies to primatology, for example, and things like that. And a project I'm currently working on, this is very early stages with my colleague Danielle, where I believe we have rather different views from yourself um, on this is questions of um, gender, for example. So if there's, um, if the anti-essentialist stuff I've been saying is true, and what we really need to look at is the practices that give rise to um, our use of um, words like man and woman, for example, then I think um, there's a lot we can learn from Wittgenstein in terms of um, not assuming that we're going to give necessary and sufficient conditions for someone being um, a man or a woman. Um, so that's sort of, uh, I, I hope, a fair range of examples. Mm -hmm. So I would like to end with uh, how Wittgenstein ends his first book, the Tractatus. He says, whereof one can speak 
therefore one must be silent. What's the meaning of this? It's very, it seems to have a, like a hidden meaning. What's the meaning of, of this quote? Uh, it, seems, <laughs> it, it seems almost tempting to remain silent, um, silent in, in response to, to the question. Um, but I'll, I'll um, um, do my best to answer it. Um, and again, I, I should preface this with, um, of all the remarks Wittgenstein makes, books have been written with very opposing sides of, on what this means. So in, entire schools of Wittgensteinian thought um, have emerged um, as a consequence of how to understand this remark. So whatever I'll say in the next minute is, is absolutely not going to do justice to people who find themselves on um, a very different side of um, how to read the tractatus. But it, it's I, um, so with with that sort of um, qualification, um, it's it seems to me that in this period, Wittgenstein thinks that there are things that we cannot sensibly talk about. And we mentioned earlier um, what Wittgenstein means by senseless and, and nonsense in these in these contexts. So there's the thought that whatever isn't captured by the, the picture theory of language, which will include ethics, it will include um, God, it will include questions about the meaning of life. Um, these are things that kind of verificationists such as e um, Ayer wanted to dismiss as um, nonsense in a, in a very sort of nasty way that um, people who um, who talk about these things are complete fools and they're not saying anything and there's nothing of importance to be said because it's nonsense. Um, or to take an expressivist approach where what you're really doing is you're expressing some kind of sentiment, feeling um, or emotion. Now, Wittgenstein, at different bits of his early period, was tempted by, by both of these um, views I've just mentioned. Um, but at the end of the Tractatus, what he seems to think is that there are these important things, but we we just cannot talk about them. And anything we do try and say um, will indeed be nonsense. So we, we ought to remain silent so that we don't talk nonsense. But that doesn't mean that these things aren't, that there aren't important things there, which is why people sometimes think of Wittgenstein in this phase as a kind of mystic. Um, things get um, very complicated when it looks like most of the Tractatus um, has involved saying the kinds of things which, according to this final statement, um, would amount to, and, and the propositions that precede it would amount to nonsense. So there's this kind of worry in early Wittgenstein scholarship to do with, well, what exactly can be said? And does um, there's this kind of so-called important nonsense of ethics and um, maybe religion and so on. But what about these cases where philosophers try and say things that would be nonsense? Has Wittgenstein himself done this um, throughout the Tractatus and uh, different views about this? And if we apply it, do we apply it to all the propositions of the tractators or just some and so on? So think of the the kind of people who Wittgensteinians accuse of as doing nonsense when they think they're doing philosophy, talking about the equivalent of beetles and boxes and what I see as blue and red and whatever. If that is happening in the tractators, is this stuff that he should have um, remained silent about? And hence the remark about the propositions being um, a ladder that we throw away once we've climbed. But of course, there's different interpretations of that remark. I think that was a very comprehensive explanation of that. So in closing, are you, are you currently involved in any projects or publications yourself? Um, so I'm involved in a sort of almost embarrassing number of, of projects. Maybe I'll just mention a few that, that most closely relate to what we've been talking about. And they've been the reason why there's so many is that they've been ongoing for a while. 
and so I kind of move back and, and forth. Um, so one is a, a book on action in ethics, which is a provisionary title, which takes the sort of things, the sort of distinctions we talked about in relation to action explanation and later responsibility, and really tries to re-examine um, especially normative ethics through these questions and maybe dissolve some some debates in normative ethics and reframe um, some, some of the other questions in normative ethics. And this is, for me, something that's, um, I've written some papers on this now, but the book will take a very long time because it involves some very uh, intricate debates. Um, another project is this work on understanding um, others. So I spoke a bit about Wittgenstein in relation to this. So I'm I'm working, I'm sort of halfway through a book on Wittgenstein's remark, um, if a lion could speak, we could not understand him and what's going on with that remark. And really Wittgenstein, how Wittgenstein can help us in debates about understanding animals, AI, other humans, other cultures, and so on. And this links up a bit to my work with Microsoft on AI intel intelligibility. And finally, I'll be starting this um, project in September on, um, it's really on concepts in transition. So I'm interested in, um, the project will be mainly on transgender, but I'm interested in, um, I guess what's called conceptual engineering and conceptual amelioration. Um, neither of which are things that I've been in favor of in the way in which they're defined by the people who talk about them. Um, but what I'm interested in there is questions such as debates about whether almond milk should be called milk, for example. And again, this sort of essentialist push towards saying it's only milk if it comes from a goat or a cow or something like that, and then looking at the practices and how um, the use of of words evolves as our behavior and practices and life goals and aspirations change. Um, so these are sort of, I guess, a number of different projects, but I hope you can see how they all link up to my two main interests. Absolutely. So, Professor Sandis, I would really like to thank you for your participation in the podcast. My pleasure. Thank you. All the best. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much. Thank you. You have just listened to Premise Podcast. Subscribe to Premise Podcast on YouTube and make sure to follow the podcast on Twitter and Facebook. The podcast is also available on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher and Spotify. Please consider supporting Premise Podcast on Patreon to help bring philosophy to the public. See you next week. Thanks for listening.